Hello and welcome to another episode of DIY uh, Indie Musicians Talking Music. It's my pleasure to have Mark here from Pocket Lint. Lint. How are you doing, Mark? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Martin. How are you? I'm doing just fine. And I also have my another guest in the studio, which is my guitar that I just bought. It's uh, as you were asking before, it's actually it's a Yamaha. It's a Yamaha Pacifica, but it's obviously a Stratocaster from from style. And uh, I, I'm taking John uh, Mickey's advice, actually, and uh, I'm, I'm learning the guitar. So I'm really looking forward to it. And we can talk about that later because I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your you know, uh, how you compose your, your composition strategies and stuff like that, because I always find that interesting. But before then, Mark, yeah. you were saying you have a new record. You've been very busy, boy, just by the by. Yeah. Uh, because you, in the last, I guess, in this year, which is just coming to a close, you released your first album, Pebbles, you said in September. Well, Pebbles is an EP, but I released... It's an EP. Sorry about that. Okay. And Oh, sorry, the album was A Grey Opaque. Yep, that's it. And that was in the spring, if I'm not yeah, mistaken? July. July. Excellent. July. And you've got a new one coming out. You said it, yes. it's about to be mastered. So you said it's coming out in March, Fingers which is crossed. called Gallery. Yeah. Fingers yeah. crossed. So yeah, uh, what, what's what's the cause of all this uh, create this great burst of creativity? Um, partly, I think, to keep me sane. Um, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like as a as a brief sort of history, I all the way through my teens and twenties, I played in bands. Right. And you know, the the aim was to make music absolutely my life, and and sort of I dedicated most of my twenties to that. Played hundreds of gigs, released some singles, released an album with my band, and I think by the yeah sometimes things run out of steam, and by the time we released the album the steam was definitely getting to the point where there wasn't that much temperature left in it. Now, now and, how um, much time is it, how much time had it, had it been by then since the inception of the band to the release of the, eight, the nine years. Album? Wow. Which, yeah. So I, I think my advice to anyone would be, because really it should have been our third album by that point would be if you've got stuff, go and record it. Yeah. Also, we were still probably playing by the old music rules at the time. We, we sort of straddled that period of it changing. And yeah. so no one really knew what to do. Yeah, so, and, and I, I think as well, I, I know I know some musicians who actually did record, but what's funny is most of them tended to be more in genres hmm. where, where they knew there was no chance of getting signed to a label yeah. or anything like that or getting management. So they just did it themselves because they figured otherwise they're never going to get a chance. And I, I think that's the right way to go. Um, yeah. I think looking back, that would have been better. But so that band broke up in about 2012. Um, really, it should have broken up a couple of years earlier, but we were old, old friends. Oh, okay. And so, you know, you keep plowing on because almost you've invested so much of yourself into it. You can't yeah. quite close the lid on it. Um, and then I I sort of did nothing, really. I played bass uh, for someone for a few gigs in 2013, 14, and then put it to bed for the best part of five years. Um, and in 2018, I tentatively started recording again, mm -hmm. 2019 a little bit, but you know, we're talking like two weekends every three months, not yeah. what I do now. Um, and then really two things happened, obviously lockdown first and foremost. <laughs> so suddenly working from home, not, and I was shielding. Um, so I've got cystic fibrosis, so. Oh, okay. The, the prognosis was that really you cannot go out, you cannot catch this thing, otherwise it's really going to be yeah. bad. Um, and so I had lots of spare time and lots of free evenings. And also I got new medication, which gave me a lot more energy. So being able to go into the studio after finishing work as opposed to getting home and crashing made a huge difference. And yeah. sort of 2020, I released... Um, my second EP, well, I released my first EP as well, but wrote and recorded my second EP. The first EP was sort of the culmination of the last two years. And then as I was releasing that, I had already started work on the next one. Finished that around the Christmas and then started, I made a, an album to an imaginary film because I've always wanted to make a film soundtrack. 
and no one was going to pay me to do that. So I thought a bit like the people you kind of alluded to, the best way around this is I'll make a, a soundtrack to a film that doesn't exist yeah. because that way I can make it exactly what I want it to be and I can write the story to fit the bits of music I want to write. Yeah, well, and a bit of a tribute to the sort of godfather of ambient as well, right? Well, because no, I was more... Brian Eno, one of his earliest ambient records was uh, was music for film. Yeah, it was, no. but I was actually directly sort of referencing um, Barry Adamson. Okay. You, you know Barry from um, Bad Ma the magazine, what well, magazine and the Bad Seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and really luckily last year, I, I spoke to him about it, actually. It was really, really, really sweet. Um, but <clears throat> so I did that and that sort of, I don't know, that gave me a new way of working because I think mm -hmm. I've been a guitarist. That that was certainly how I saw myself as a teen. I mm -hmm. played guitar. I didn't write songs. Yeah. I, I was the guitar player. And then I started to write more and more songs. And with that, I started to write more and more lyrics. And by the end of my band, I was probably writing a good 50% of the lyrics and 90, 95% of the music. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started to sort of, I think, change the way I saw myself. I saw myself then as a, a songwriter. And I would say now I see myself as someone who makes music. Yeah. And that maybe is a bit broader. And also I think it opens more avenues for creativity for me. I'm not stuck to trying to write a particular type of song. I think I've opened up what I can view as my music. Yeah. And that in itself has been immense. And I tend to these days write more on piano uh, mm. and keyboards and, mm -hmm. and use guitars almost as ornamentation. I mean, that's still what I'm by a long way best at. Stick yep. a guitar in my hand and it, it's easier. But I think almost the struggle of trying to work new equipment and trying to find new ways of, of writing has been for me really, really productive. And I think there is also a point where if you played guitar as long as I have, and it's now 30 odd years, 30 years, exactly. Um, you kind of feel like, and you obviously haven't, but to an extent you've exhausted all the different things or ways you could start approaching songwriting from that avenue. Yeah. So, I mean, last year, or well, 2021, in fact, I discovered Lou Reed's alternative tuning, ostrich tuning that he used on the first Velvet's album. Mm -hmm. And that was his attempt to kind of fit into the whole Lemonte Young drone thing. Yeah. And obviously Kale did as well. And that was great because all of a sudden I had a different set of textures and, and tonalities to work with. Um, because I've never gone down the Joni Mitchell a million different guitar tunings route. I mean, I've used Dadgad a bit, but mostly I've used standard tuning. Um, so that was really interesting. But one of the things that I have a, a really good old friend who was the guy who first showed me how to play a guitar mm -hmm. um, when I was 13. And he he said what was interesting about my, my music since 2021 and since writing the kind of the synth based um, film soundtrack was that I approach playing guitar differently. Like I'm seeing it now more for the textures it creates than necessarily in the way that I would have done when, you know, I was a huge, huge fan of lots and lots of great guitar players, but guitarists, not yeah. general musicians in the same sense. Um, so I think that's been, for me, quite pleasing. And I think those set of sort of factors have snowballed together and created this thing where now, it's fun. It's equally as likely that I'll release gallery and then be absolutely stuck and have nothing else to say for a bit. Um, and if that happens, that, you know, that happens. Yeah. And um, there's not much I can do about that. There's, but I, I have an inkling. It's not going to, at the moment, it seems to be flowing quite well. And, and I'm finding yeah. lots of new ways of creativity. Now I've long been a believer that the more input you take in, the more output you're likely to create. You know, if you read a lot, if you watch a lot of films, if you experience lots of different things, whether that's, you know, you're living an incredibly exciting life, which perhaps when you're younger, you might do, or if you're at a slightly more sort of sedentary age like me, then you are 
experiencing it via other mediums as opposed to you know partying incredibly hedonistically and writing mm -hmm. about that so i think there's a there's a lot to be said for that when people sort of say i don't know what to write about well what are you reading what are you what are you taking in what are you being challenged by what are you questioning what what input is going into that because yeah. otherwise you are going to just produce the same stuff yeah. that you always but, but don't you find i find with myself i've got a notepad that i have sort of around and i'll i'll hear a line or a phrase or or something and i'll just jot it down and oftentimes that'll be the 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 impetus that starts a lyric right and and half the time i don't even know what it means i just like the sound of it or or what or what sometimes is even crazier is where like if i have no idea for lyrics and i'm writing a song i'll just sing mm. um and let just and have to come up with something and i open my mouth and then you know you'll come up with usually a phrase or something that at least musically sounds good and then you can start twisting it around and practicing and changing and 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 refining that but if it, it but if that isn't there it ends up being like you know you're 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 i don't know preaching on top of of notes yeah i two things that you just said are really interesting because normally I think my way of working is possibly a little bit theoretically driven in that I'm tending to have a theme that I'm writing about and so the lyrics mm -hmm. almost suggest themselves because of the topic so yeah an example of what you said about having a line on my is it on gray opaque I can't remember it's on my ep4 Anyway, I think it is on Grey Opaque, a song called um, Red Dust, which yep. is written about the death of the Mars Opportunity rover. And NASA published the line, I think it's something like 2018, uh, it's getting dark and my battery's, uh, no, yeah, it's getting dark and my battery's low. Yeah, and exactly as you said, that went straight into the lyric notebook of like, it's fantastic. what a great, what a great fantastic opening line lyric. of the song. It's a fantastic uh, lyric, and you can tell the the last the the last few moments of the robot before it dies. And so I decided yeah. to create a a song based around that. So that was very driven. Yeah. But then this idea of spontaneous lyrics that was completely new to me mm. until I did Pebbles, and um, and Pebbles was a deliberate attempt to force myself to work completely differently. So taking away this theory driven like idea and notion of the ambience of the song and the whole aim before i've written it because sometimes i would sort of have entire pages of of vocabulary that i thought would be suitable for this song yeah. cover an entire page of that and then pick and take it in to create that atmosphere with the words but this with pebbles the idea was that each song effectively is is like the lines on a beach pebble random and, and different and it i mostly wrote all the all of the music improvised mm -hmm. um so tried not to overdub anything tried not to go back and correct anything just wanted it to be as it was and i improvised all of the lyrics which and again tried not to go back and fix anything i think there might have been one vocal overdub because the note was wrong and that that was it um which i found really frightening because it was a totally different way of working, but it worked far better than I would have expected it to have done for someone who you know normally likes to have everything sussed out and spend quite a lot of time working on how the lines kind of fit around the music. And perhaps because the music in a sense was made up of fewer parts, it, was perhaps easier to do that over the top of rather yeah. than uh, i think there was a, a tendency to be for me to be almost quite baroque in the amount of ornamentation going i, I was i was going to say over analytical yeah yeah i think i think definitely <laughs> that might be good but but not of the music but at least of the the process yeah. so let me ask you are you familiar at all with uh how our how we actually think how our brain brains actually work 
Uh, that really depends on from what perspective. So, oh I, well, yeah, with the, the the two hemispheres. Oh yes, and and yeah. the slow and the fast thinking and yeah. the analytical versus what you would probably call more your unconscious mind, that actually takes in a lot more sensory data than your conscious one does. Uh, which is which is why often intuition is so right, uh, because it isn't really intuition; it's just a very high level of perception. But uh, what what I what I thought when you were you were talking about doing the music more spon in a more spontaneous manner is that you were using that unconscious side of your mind. So you may have you probably had thought I, I think with me because I, I tend to lean on that quite a bit, especially with lyrics. But it's a long story. As I started out, I've been a singer for many years, and I always had to do the lyrics. And then when I decided I was going to make the music and become the producer and do everything else, um, I started treating myself like the singer and hated oh. doing the lyrics. <laughs> you know, so it's like I had to come up with new ways of doing them, right? Uh, but but what 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 I find interesting is that I think that those things that seem to be spontaneous aren't really spontaneous. Oh. Because what they are is it's something you've been thinking about, or usually if you've listened to the music over and over and over again, and you you know it's you're playing it around when you can start mm -hmm. hearing it, and it's, it's sort of become a personal earworm. Yeah. Then you're you're I think you're trying out words without really being conscious of it, or you're. you're I, I think you're probably themes. probably right, but yeah. actually I would say to an extent that's what I do always. Hmm. So. Even even with the stuff that's quite thought out, it's only thought out in terms of the theory of the mood I want to create. I never okay. yeah. map out the music. I allow a lot of spontaneity in the creation of the music. I then might self-edit and say, no, that actually doesn't yeah. work. That can go. But I I don't tend to these days, and that, that would be very different from writing for a band. Yeah. Because obviously... In a band A, I had to be able to play it live as a four piece and whatever was in my head, the bassist had to be able to understand rather than me just play it and stick it on a record. Um, but these days I, I do that. But I suppose Pebbles was different because most of them were composed and finished in about an hour. So I didn't know mm. the music at all, really. And it yeah. hadn't been going anywhere. It was it was almost like a, a sort of a desperate response to a bike running down a hill of what am I going to do here? What what vocally does fit here? Um, you know, obviously I knew the key or approximately knew the keys because some of them were not necessarily in a, in a key anyway. Um, but I totally agree with you. I think. I think you, you very often make smarter musical choices when you act instinctively as opposed to having it you know written in a score that you then follow that's not to say that i don't think you can achieve amazing things by doing it that way but i like to have a very fixed plan and then allow for a lot of movement within that plan yeah when i'm i'm writing and i i find that's how i'm more likely to come up with something that i really like mm -hmm. if i'm trying to trying to give myself freedom and responding intuitively to yeah to the music and, and to the mood as well. Yeah. And um, I think, listen, I think mistakes can be magic as well. God, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, and it's the time you get it wrong that it's like, <laughs> oh my God, that's it. <laughs> you know? And what, then you change it, everything you know, around. It? Honor, it's all honor, your, honor your mistakes like unconscious intention. Probably. I, I think, and sometimes it's just happen chance and, you know, and I... I think I think that myself it's it's quite interesting because I I I found over the years and I keep saying it over and over again is that I really look for the lemons I look for the worst parts of the song, uh, and generally by the time you're finished, they're the best parts of the song, mm. and, and it's sort of lemons to lemonade. If there's no lemons, you don't make lemonade, right? So it isn't the idea that you don't make mistakes, but oftentimes the mistakes are. As you said, they're either unconscious or sometimes it's just the having the ear to hear it. Because mm. I've also I've also started making ambient music, and the way that I make that it's quite funny. I, I do it all live, uh, and then I 
you know, I'll have 20, 20 tracks and I'll just start editing and finding the little bits I like and then putting them together yeah, and repeating them and, and trying to find a theme without getting too, because I find, I find the trick with ambient at least because I I've, I've listened to it for years and I quite like it is it has to almost have a melody, mm. but if it has a full melody, it's not ambient anymore. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it has to hint at it. but it, it has to have a hint. You have to have a hint of something. I mean, half the time it's just us making patterns, right? Because we're mm. just the ultimate pattern makers. Uh, and we love patterns. And then our ears, our ears go crazy over patterns. Um, but it has to be finding that nice balance. And then, it, and then you can have a quite a wonderful piece, you know. It's interesting. The, the method that you're using really reminds me of, um, do you know the English band James? Yes, I love James. So James, I think in their early days, that was how they composed. They would jam. Mm -hmm. And then go back into a jam and listen for bits that they thought were good. What what wasn't wasn't that uh, I I I know a similar story, but uh, I've been obsessed with Brian Eno for many years, and he produced an album of theirs, and that album that's supposedly how that was all written. Right, it's a band that had like I think hit a real brick wall. They they reached the year eight, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean, and had like some success, and then couldn't come up with the next album and so they ended up with brian eno and what he did is i think he had two studios and the band members were going around from one another and there he's making them play instruments that weren't their instruments and doing a lot of crazy stuff uh well a lot of the kind of thing he's known for a, a lot of enoing yeah <laughs> and the result it was a great album i can't remember what it was called it was i think their last one I, I don't know if they did anything after that but it was a very very fine album uh and it it it, it really sort of took them to another <laughs> another level but i think i think that that's it could be that they'd already started that way but the story i, I, I heard well was, i think the story I, I know is that that's what they used to do when they rehearsed Oh, like in okay. a in a scout hut when they were kids so maybe in a way he was taking them back to actually the thing that made them it an interesting well band be. in the beginning it could well and um, listen, there's so many jam bands that that's the way that they worked right you know yeah i mean the most extreme being like captain beefheart <laughs> which is that's a whole other <laughs> you know <laughs> insanity but anyway it is, although I do think if you listen to like Trout Mass Replica, yeah, enough, you start to zone into it. And, and talking about the patterns thing, you start to to find the threads that join it together. Yeah, it takes effort, you know. Yeah, it's not something that you zone into the very first time you put it on the turntable, but you do. Well, it's it's, it's 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 a no known scale. Is the yeah. problem with it, right? That it, it's so foreign to the ear. But yeah, no, but there are, there's a lot of hooks in it. It's a very hooky record, you know, but they're all things that he found. I, I think as well, he would like, I, I'll have to, I can't remember who it was. There's a book about the making of that. Right. Uh, and the whole story is just absolutely, it was like a cult. They were literally all locked into this house together and, and he didn't like actually play anything or do any music so one of the musicians he would hum things and the musician like one of the guys would transcribe it and then teach it to the band <laughs> right that's how they did it and most of that is all live right that's the crazy thing too yeah is it's, it's like that record was all just recorded live you know i mean that's by frank zappa i think he was on there on frank zappa's label wasn't it? anyway yeah but nutty, nutty stuff. But it's wonderful. Listen, it's wonderful that things like that happened. And and you could release that, you know, today with some cute 20-somethings and everyone would believe that it was the next big thing. That, <laughs> you know? That's true. The other thing is that you could release it and people would actually go and buy it and give it a chance as well. Yeah. And I think that that makes a big difference I, I mean so many of my favorite albums are albums that the first time i put them on you're really not sure about them and it takes you a while but you know 
I'm old enough that I didn't have that much money that if I bought something, it was going to get played a fair few times before I decided to dismiss it because yeah, I wasn't going to be buying any other record for the next exactly. couple of weeks. You were invested so, until that yeah. next record, right? <laughs> so, yeah, even, even if you picked it up later, and I, I still try and force myself back to records, um, you know, stuff that I picked up maybe in charity shops because you used to get, it's now expensive again, but you used to be able to pick up vinyl for 50p, 20p. Yeah. in charity shops and if it had a decent fun cover it was going home with me you know it was like yeah. no idea who this is or you know i have a vague inkling of something or i like the label let's take it i mean i found um oh, i was the new york poet um I had a relationship with patty smith um oh he wrote basketball diaries jim carroll Okay. I found the Jim Carroll band that way. Just I look, I liked the look of the front cover. His hair reminded me a bit of Bowie in The Man Who Fell to Earth. That was enough. Like you're coming home. There's two albums. Great, we'll take you. You know, best fifty pence I think I ever spent. Yeah, um, it, it's uh, yeah, it, it, the the good old old sort of used record stores and you know stores that would sell in garage sales or I guess I I don't know what the equivalent. I guess it's street markets that'd be yeah, sold yeah. on street markets right in in the uk yeah i i found a lot that way too um so what what of those old what of the old albums have still sort of stuck with you because i find there's some things i'll play like years after mm. and go wow that is still a good album it's hot it's really you know it's really co completely uh held up and then there are other things. It's like, how could I have liked that back? <laughs> it's just awful. That's a that's a good question. I mean, and I think also you have to separate to an extent. And music's really difficult with this, isn't it? Because some of it is an emotional investment in nostalgia. That yeah. it's quite hard to separate yourself listening to it now. Although actually, in a way, I think the the test is: would you listen to it twice in a row? Um, and if no, then perhaps the reason it was put on again was nostalgia rather than actual enjoyment. But um, I, th I think from various points in, in my life, there are, are bits that I probably would never listen to again. But there's quite a lot that I definitely would. So my, as I said, when we spoke before we came on, my first love musically was Jimi Hendrix. So when I was just 13, um, my friend at school basically introduced me to Jimi Hendrix and I had no real conception of the guitar. I played piano, um, at school and had done for seven years, I think, by that point. And I don't know why it might have been, been the mood of the day, but I looked at, you know, my friend playing this song by Hendrix and just thought, well, that's what I need to do. I need to know how to do that. So this is cool. I'm going to do this. And from Hendrix kind of followed the classic sort of classic rock thing of Zeppelin, um, Yardbirds. And I would listen to all of that stuff, probably Zeppelin less these days, not because I don't like them, but I think because I sort of overdosed on them to an extent as a kid. Um, and a lot of 60s stuff. So both my parents were, were very into some 60s rock and pop, but different ends of it. So my dad was probably more into prog and mm -hmm. the progier side. And my mom was probably more into the modier end and probably more stuff like stacks. Okay. Uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. I, and they carried on listening to and buying music until, well, really in, until fairly recently, I would say. Um, but all of that, I would probably still listen to. Then around 93, when I was 14, I sort of started to get into a lot of alternative music and I still listen to a lot of that. But I think when I was 14, 15, the, the kind of the Britpop scene was happening and I was very invested in that because it was my age. And there's bits of it that I would absolutely listen to bands like Suede, Blur, and there are bits of it that I wouldn't touch <laughs> with a barge pole that you know, for, for a few weeks in 94, I might have thought this was the best band in the world. Yeah. Um, it's quite evident that that was not the case. Um, but I think it's like anything. The, 
the stuff that was good that has a a quality to it and a uniqueness lasts and I then kind of worked my way backwards through alternative music and um and also partly through bands that mentioned bands other bands so you know Blur kind of put me in in touch with bands like XTC mm. and Wire yeah. and also um my mum's partner at the time my sort of stepdad he really liked Scar so the specials uh, and Madness I'd already got on my own, actually, from being younger. So all of that stuff as well. And just sort of anything really with guitars was fair game. So anything from kind of 50s rock and roll up until probably when I went to guitar school. So I dropped out of uni when I was 19 to go and play guitar. And guitar school was, well, it wasn't for me. Um, I wanted to play guitar the way I wanted to play guitar and they wanted to make me a session guitarist and there's absolutely mm-hmm. nothing wrong with wanting to be a session guitarist but that was never what I wanted to do. Yeah, um, I wanted to write my own songs and play my way and I, I've always said I was very lucky that I had six years of guitar playing and probably a hundred or so gigs at that point behind me because I think if I'd been less headstrong and maybe a bit less experienced but Started guitar at kind of 15, 16, I would have just done what they wanted me to do. Yeah. Um, and as it turned out, that totally got me into synthesizers. <laughs> so being forced to play guitar eight hours a day, the last thing I wanted to do when I got home was play was more listen guitar. To or think about more guitar. Yeah. It was, yeah. um, it was, well, what else is that that I've previously ignored? Um, mm-hmm. and I, I can't remember which which way it went first. I think I think the honest answer is first I started to get into kind of the early eighties electro pop from Britain and fairly quickly after sort of craft work. I think it was that way way around. The cool story would be I discovered craft work first. But that's that I don't think that's true. Um but they're a name that you know I'd known and seen around for a bit and and I kind of went off in that direction. Um yeah for a for a little while and i've always kind of vacillated between those two worlds of kind of guitars and and more electronic music but i've never really made the electronic music yeah that was mm-hmm. for me an undiscovered country until fairly recently yeah and, and did you get into any of the sort of more san francisco electronica or just um stuff like silver apples and well silver apples were from new york and quite recent but uh tuxedo moon no i don't know at all yeah, there, there's there's some some stuff on your. Uh, are they are they on, the hmm? are they on boot uh, on booklers or what what when when we talking? They were they they would have been out uh, early eighties seventies. Oh, okay, so they they were contemporary with uh, the residents. Oh, okay, uh, they they were part of that whole scene, but much more electronic. Right, and I think they only released two or three EPs. They didn't release all that much. It's quite they're quite obscure, but some some of the stuff that that tends to be a little bit more sequenced and rhythmic, mm. uh, you should check them out. I think yeah, you, I will. Uh, you know it'd be one of those things. Is oh, I, I was channeling them and didn't know. Yeah, I was rip- <laughs> channeling's the polite word for ripping off, isn't it? No, well, <laughs> I don't think it is because I think sometimes you know, given the same uh, tools certain people will just come up with similar solutions right it's it's not necessarily that you're you know i mean you can obviously be ripping off and a lot of the things are but i it's it's not necessarily you know i don't think it's necessarily the case no i i think you're right and i think there's that whole point of eventually streamlining design and and form you end up with the same shapes right i mean yeah there's only (laughs) <laughs> there's only sometimes a couple of answers to the question and and yeah. there will get me this convergence of of sound yeah. and design in that case. well and, and as has been proven by sort of contemporary music there's only so far you can go from any scale yeah uh to the point where it just becomes white noise you know or or unlistenable basically mm-hmm. Because it doesn't, you know what I mean? The the ear has to enjoy listening to it. Yeah. And if not, you're not going to listen, right? Yeah, if not, yeah. you're going to go, that's very, very clever. Thank you. <laughs> and now make it stop. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the best example of that is, did, did you ever listen to, uh, what is it called, metal machine music? Yes. It's unlistenable. I mean, there, there's you can listen to a couple of minutes of it. It's okay. I mean, you, you get some really good feedback, but two, a double album of feedback is just, you know. I, I, I don't even think he listened to the whole thing. Oh, probably not. It's probably just the poor engineer and the guy who yeah. had to master it, but they were getting paid at least, right? I mean, one of the interesting things I think about about feedback on, is some people don't see it, or some people I think don't consider it music. And I, I think one of the things that you find really quickly is who is a skilled user of feedback. And who can actually integrate it successfully? Because it can create all of these incredible overtones that of out of a guitar, you won't get any other way. Yeah. Um, you know, I think feedback, doesn't it square the wave? I think from a... From yeah. A it, it, all that I can tell you is when I decided that I was going to start learning a guitar and was going to buy a guitar, I started doing some research. Like, what's the best cheap guitar I can buy? I don't want to invest a lot in my first yeah. guitar. Uh, and I, I have a, a, a friend of mine who's a very avid guitarist, an avid amateur, and he was sort of helping me out a little bit. But what's interesting is I was listening to all of these reviews of, you know, uh, what does a hundred dollar guitar sound like, <laughs> you know, type thing. And the first thing I noticed, and it was quite startling because I've been listening to music for decades now, was the tone of different guitars. Mm -hmm. And it's noticeable, absolutely yeah. noticeable. And that, and that clicked for me because I'd never been really that, you know what I mean, cognizant of it before. It clicked to me. It's like, oh, that's why guitarists get so obsessed about, you know, and you have the Gibson versus, you know, Fenders and, and then, you know, people getting guitars made and all this. It, it, it all clicked in one moment because I finally realized it's all, that's what it's about. Yeah, you know that's what the tone is about. I mean, it's it's also it is also playability. But no, you're absolutely right. Although I, I also am a strong believer that a great amount of any guitarist's tone is actually here. Oh, it, it's it's the way that you. It's exactly where you place your strings for deliberate reasons, and i learned on a really bad bad guitar my first guitar was rotten um it cost i think 50 quid mm -hmm. um and the neck was a bit warped but on the plus side that meant i learned that if i wanted to play in a chord in tune i had to kind of bend one of the notes in the chord to get it to the right pitch and it's not a bad I mean, thing no i i actually think it's it was a bad thing if i'd it would have put me off if I hadn't been like laser focused set on this was what I was going to do with my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but obviously that meant that when you kind of, you get a better guitar, suddenly it's like, Oh, this is easy. <laughs> um, and all of that technique that I've sort of apps accidentally developed, you can now employ to good purpose as opposed to just trying to make it stay in tune. Yeah. Um, and my, my guitar teacher when I was really young, was an amazing, amazing musician. Um, he used to play in Kate Bush's backing band mm. um, <clears throat> and played with quite a lot of other people. He was quite jazzy and quite sort of... He would say his main instrument, I think, these days, well, really for the last 30 years, has been keyboards, but he played guitar and multi-instrumentalist type stuff. Um, but he <clears throat> really, really, I think, taught me about tone and how to improvise and how to play. And I was really lucky that when I was sort of 14, 15, he would encourage me to get up on stage and play with him and his band. And I think when I was 17, 18, he sort of, one summer, I ended up playing bass for him for a few gigs. And that was an amazing experience in understanding how as well tone fits into a band. Because in my band, it was like, well, it's kind of my band. so. We're playing, we're playing, and the most important thing is that I sound good. <laughs> Not so fussed about you guys, to be honest. Um, yeah. 
And obviously then thinking from a different perspective, this is clearly not your band. <laughs> You're the little 17 year old playing bass. And how do you fit that into the rest of the tones? And, and how do you as well play with someone who doesn't know what they're going to be playing? There's no set list written out. You're just responding to the music as it's happening and, and learning to, to basically just trust your ear. Yeah. And, you know, all walking bases of like, boom, boom, boom. Oh, I found the key. Yeah, we're good. We're in a key. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, working like that. And his, his tone was always great. And he, this was the point of the story. He almost always had cheaper guitars. Yeah. Um, he never spent a lot of money on guitars. And yet you would see him playing guitar out of a cheap guitar and it would sound brilliant. And you would see someone else who'd kind of, um, as as my former bass player would maybe have put it, because he used to work in a music shop in London, all the gear, no idea, <laughs> kind of. You <laughs> bought a, a three thousand pound guitar that is mostly there to go on your wall and to impress your mates with how much it's cost. Yeah. You play it and you still make it sound like crap. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, that, that, listen, that, that makes perfect sense from the story of your warped guitar, right? Yeah. Because it, it, it obviously is, you know, if you have the technique, you can make a substandard guitar sound good, you know, or, or a less than ideal guitar yeah. sound good. You know, and really excluding sweet. all of these weird things with some of the vintage guitars where, you know, there's there's circuitry and magic and weird stuff that they can't, you know they can't necessarily recapture. I mean, I can see the value at that point as a musician when you're trying for a specific thing or what, whatever. And, you know, and they and do get to as well as well as these guitars. Like, <laughs> about, about the wood. I mean, you know, it's a bit yeah. like violins and Strad's white, Swire Stradivarius is so good because the, the wood has, has created that. The tension within it is now at a perfect point. But my, my original rubbish guitar, I, I never could bear to throw it away. So... I've still got it, but a couple of years ago, no, last year, my my friend, the guy who first showed me how to play guitar, replaced the neck on it for me and fixed it up. Oh. Um, so I've been using it quite a lot recently, oh, nice. uh, and it's a lot better now. He's he's fixed it. And <laughs> well, yeah, it, it sounds neck. like it. It play it plays okay now, and I think I've used it on. Um, I think I've used it on a bit on Grey Opaque, and it was the only guitar I used on Pebbles actually. But nice. that's not necessarily because it was the guitar I chose to use. It's more that I'm really lazy and couldn't be bothered to change to change the strings on any of those. When I had the idea of okay, I'm going to play guitar on this. Listen, like, well, don't guitars. No, no, I, I bought. I, I got my guitar. The first thing I did was try to tune it, and immediately broke a string. Ah. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, it's uh, the, the joys of it. The, yeah, you know. I mean that is. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm better these days. I used to mostly break strings every show. Well, I think I think as well as my friend, my my good friend came over and uh, he had a set of a, a spare set of strings and he he restrung it for me and showed me how to do it and tuned it. And as he said, he said a lot of the guitars. I mean, when they're shipping them with the strings, these are just terrible quality strings. Yeah. So I think it was partly that as well. Because of course it was the E. Well, what other string would it be, right? That's the the one that generally, you know, yeah, goes the first. thinnest of all, right? Uh, but since then, it's great. It's it sort of stayed in tune. And I think the problem is, is like when you start out, tuning is it's a even oh, with yeah. even with an electron or you know electric to you know electronic tuner or whatever is it's it's hard to get your mind around and it's easy to overwind. Yeah, when you're trying to find. You, you know, when you're trying to find the, the, the note, right? But anyway, no, that's uh, fascinating stuff. So so tell me, um, I mean, two of the things that I'm interested in once I, I you know, I, I get somewhat confident on guitar. Of course, we talked about one, which is feedback. And the other one is really looping and, uh, you know, and reverb and and all of that, which I all already do a lot with, with my music, even though not with a guitar. So... Is is that is that something that you're straying into or not really looping? I've always, to an extent, avoided. I've so I've never played live that's solo. That sounds like part. your next project. Then why are you avoiding it? Potentially. Um. Why am I avoiding it? I don't know really. I've got. I mean, I'm. I saw. Um. 
earlier this year. And again, names are not good for me, but the guitarist who used to be in Bowie's band, Irish Robert guy. Or, um, or, or, let me think, um, which, which iteration? So in the 90s, 90s lineup of Bowie's band, um, he's now playing oh, Adrian Vega. Blue? No, no. I think he had Adrian Ballou for a while. That um, was the late 70s, though. Um, yeah, no, that, that's true. Jerry Leonard. Robert. Jerry, Le Jerry Leonard. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That much, yeah. Uh, and he he was playing with Suzanne Vega and using... Okay. There were only the two of them on stage, and he was using a lot of loop and a lot of um, reverb effects. Pretty much that mm -hmm. was all to create mm -hmm. these beautiful, big, lush backdrops to yeah. to her music, because obviously she's just well, an acoustic guitar in her. And are are, really, you, fami really are you familiar with No Pussy Footing? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Is it, there, there's your blueprint. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, but things like... There, I think that there, must, there must I've be never a... Played with. Yeah, no, but there, there must be... Um, there must be a, a, a software emulation too of uh, of the frip box. I'd be shocked if there isn't. Yeah, I mean, I think you can. I mean, you can buy pedals. You can buy one, yeah. Well, if you yeah. want the hardware, right? I think he um, sells them or he's licensed it, and someone's hmm. producing them. But, but yeah, it's never been. I don't know. I. It was interesting, and it may be a somewhere I'm, I'm going to have a, have a look at my. When I was younger, the guitar effects I mostly used, I still use chorus a lot. I, mm -hmm. I love chorus on the guitar, particularly chorus and distortion together, um, which is John McGeer from Magazine, really. Yeah. Oh, actually, his is flange. He uses flange and distortion. Um, and he used to have his flanger on a, on a mic stand so he could alter it while he was playing a chord. So strum right. a chord, alter it to, to kind of add depth to it. Mm hmm but I never really used any sort of delays or reverbs. And I bought one earlier this year. Um, and it's, it's been really interesting to, to experiment with it, but actually I'm enjoying experimenting it more with keyboards hmm. and guitar. I'm getting more enjoyment out of it in that, that field, particularly kind of live stuff. So I did a live for radio, um, concert earlier this year and I wanted to make the introduction to a song more interesting so yeah. I used it a lot for that almost to create loops so it's probably the closest I've done on a, a song on Grey Opaque called Carousel where I kind of built on top of it and on top of it but also of course when you've got the timing on an echo if you start removing it it starts almost creating a sound like you're tearing apart the fabric of the music and I, I love that so, you know, that, that goes right back into kind of the 60s sci-fi part of me. Uh, yeah. That enjoyment uh, and that particular sort yeah. of atonal well, pink noise. Well, one of the one of the other things I've found that becomes really fascinating, too, is that there's some stuff that I've... Because I've done a fair amount with delay and loops. And what what can get a lot of fun is if you do layers upon layers of them and you start changing the intervals obviously of your delays you'll end up getting at some point as it builds and builds it'll start it becomes like almost like a polyrhythmic and the mm. actual the, the the melody of the loop starts changing and it can change in quite radical ways and it, it, it can be quite like once you figure out how to control it because often the big problem is the fade out right <laughs> you know uh, because then there's, you know, there's things that will go on and they're at, you know, what, 72 intervals or crazy intervals by the end of it. But, uh, but th th there's a lot there. There's a lot there, there is that what, what I find with, with that. So on a similar vein, I did, I did something not totally dissimilar to that in that, um, the last track on gallery is, um, So Gallery, every song is based on a painting. And the last track on Gallery is um, it's called Graveline Evening, and it's based on the, the Surat painting. And what I wanted was to create the sound of or almost like someone like Debussy 
quite romantic piano led. Yeah. But with the way that waves come in and they go out and they come in and they go out, but every single time they're different because mm. they're hitting their own reflection and going back. So I had five different musical parts, all of different lengths, all different numbers of bars, so that when they interlap with each other, every single time you're getting that fresh, different tone. Yeah. Where the piece is only, I think, two and a half minutes, but it, you never, ever get exactly the same thing again because of one thing is five bars, one thing is, is no. six bars, one thing is two bars, one thing is four bars. So they're always constantly jarring against each other in new ways. Um, and I think I worked it out that you never get the same thing again and then stopped it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I kind of like you, you mentioned earlier, I played all of that live. So <clears throat> sort of five or six lines of, of music just recorded, played, repeated, and then stopped. And then, yeah. and then I, th I think it, it's one of the things that I actually really liked best on that, that album because it came from the, the the inception of the idea was you know it it needs to be a bit Debussy so it's going to be primarily piano led, but I I kind of allowed it to go where it wanted to go rather than being too strict about what I was actually fixing it to be. You know, yeah. the idea created the music, but it wasn't controlled by it, and I, I kind of liked that. No, it's a very it's it's an interesting approach. You know, and and I think I think a good one, um, it is, I I find especially for more electronic or you know tending towards ambient mm. music, is there has to be that element of chance to it, and this constant variation, is I I think I, you know snippets of like, like we were saying before it's snippets of a melody, yeah, it's like a melody you hear from a car passing by. Hints. Right, Hints. where you'll yeah. hear a little bit and then it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because if there's too much, the moment you start humming it, it's not ambient. Mm. <laughs> like if you can hum it, it's not ambient. That's I think probably the best way to put it. So yeah, I, I think one of the things that I think that a lot of may, maybe one of my disinterests with modern rock music or rock associated music is that a lot of the chance seems to have been cleaned out of it. A, a lot of it seems so fixed and controlled and so shoehorned in that, yeah. that all of that random possibility of something different has gone because effectively you're repeating what someone did 50 years ago, but yeah. you're not doing it fresh and also I, I think it's one of the reasons I really love that period from in 60s music from sort of 66 to about 68, 69, when there really aren't any rules for how you're supposed to be doing any of this stuff. And everyone's just making it up as they go along. Yeah. Like, is this rock? Yeah, it's all called rock. Like This, this is OK. Yeah, carry on. Just do whatever you're going to do, guys. And, and I, I really find much, I think, more satisfaction listening to mm -hmm. that stuff because they're making it up as they go as well. Yeah, well, and, and you know, you know what, you know what, post punk, yeah, it was exactly the same. It was a, it was a very similar period of not everything everything goes musically, yeah. uh, and, and, and I would say as as well the 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 kind of the coinciding with post punk, the kind of the electronic seventies yeah. to eighties scene as well, because same thing, there aren't any rules for how you're supposed to do any of this stuff. Or what yeah. you use these new instruments for, and most of the people didn't know how to play well. Yeah. So, so what they had to do is rely on their ear, as opposed to to theory that had been beaten into them. Yeah. Sort of thing where yeah. this is they know it's supposed to sound good because that's you know what what, what they like. exactly yeah. what it's supposed to sound like. But it, it's the kiss of death for any creativity. Totally agree. You know? Yeah, I think. You know, he, he's a huge influence, but there is that very thing. If you if you know what if, you know, if you're creating, go to where you don't know really what you're doing. Yeah, St stand in the water above your head level, and then you might create something interesting. But you know, working in the way that you always work is a surefire way to make a secondhand version of something you've already done. 
Exactly. And well, and the the other big one that I, I, I heard in an interview that was absolutely fascinating and I've tried as much as possible to use is uh, I think it was Tony Visconti. Um, and he was talking about uh, how he and, and Bowie liked to produce and what they would do. And it was also they weren't always using the best equipment. They didn't they weren't in the biggest studios with 48 tracks and stuff like that. A lot of the time they were in smaller studios and things. And partly out of necessity and partly out of, I think, just attitude and the, the, the approach that they took, they would very much tend to lock things down and then put something else on the track so they couldn't change it, right? Mm -hmm. So there was never that perfectionism. Yeah. That, that I, I think the, the moment, I think that that's the biggest uh, danger with 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 digital audio workstations uh you know and you you see it over and over because again. you can it, fix it doesn't you will you fix it yeah exactly and, and you're fixing it is what destroys it i my um the guy who <laughs> produced my old band's album i remember because we actually recorded the whole thing as a live band so we we sort of said you know we were a bit disappointed with the last single. And it was like, well, how did you record it? Well, we recorded it, you know, by track by track, going through the, the, the classic modern way of recording. And he's like, but you're a live band effectively, aren't you? And that's what you do. That's your bread and butter. And like, well, yeah. It was like, well, just record the whole album live and we'll overdub the vocals. But yeah. but have the singer in the room singing live. And if there's some bleed on it, it's fine. We'll, we'll deal with that. And if there are any overdubs, we can do those. It's like, but record the bolts the nuts and bolts of it live and after one of them i came through and we we're just listening i was like oh there's a there's a there's a note there and he's like do you mean the harmonics that you hit i was like yeah and he's like it sounds great if that was on any of your favorite records you'd, you'd think it. that it was brilliant they'd left it there why do you want to fix it it's, like, it's not wrong it's just an accident and it sounds great but like, yeah yeah fine <laughs> yeah you're right you're absolutely right but you're what you said about because you can there is that great, great temptation to go and fix everything and take the, almost take the joy out of it. Yeah. And, and make it so antiseptically clean and sterilized and, and lose all of the things that actually, for someone like me, are the reasons that I love the recordings from like 78 to 83. Because no one knew what they were doing and everyone's making half-assed attempts at playing this new instrument. They don't really know how it works and they're finding lots of amazing accidents out of that and producing this incredible noise. Yeah. Half the time out of necessity. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> well, limited it, studio it came up time, with right? something out of necessity and it's, just, it, and it's a hook and the hook is the mistake or the, the yeah. hook is the thing that, you know, where, where someone was, was trying at something and it didn't work out, <laughs> you know. But when you look at it, that was the thing that, you know, it's like everyone will listen to because it sounds different. And I think you it's know, also the same with out. 60s bands being put into a studio, you know, like the Beatles. And you've got four days to, to write and release a new album. So any idea that got past the being spoken about stage ends up on the record. Yeah. And that might make some of the albums a little bit inconsistent. But to me, it makes them more interesting because I can only speak from from my own experience of being in a band. But having eight years to effectively get to the point of one album, you've thrown away a lot of songs that maybe you should have done. Yeah. And you've never been under the pressure to try anything experimental because you've shoehorned everything you do to an almost perfect vision of what this band represents. Yeah. And I think it's why very often nowadays bands first albums are so strong. Because they've got to the point where everything they needed to ever say is in that one album, that one piece of work. But they've never developed another way of working. And so when it comes to the second album... It's a disaster. Or it's the same with water. You know, because yeah. you, can't, you can't get back to that feeling. Yeah. Or so they're truly a great band yeah. on a rare occasion. And the, the next album is a complete departure or a, a maturation or yeah. whatever. But that's the rarity because mostly it it's the watered down. Well, the record company wants the same record. Yeah. And they know how to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course. Well, they think they know, they how, think to they know how to sell it. Yeah. I mean, let's, these days, no one can really sell it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, 
There's a there's I, a freedom think, in that. Totally. <laughs> and I think that's why I've really tried not to not to throw away ideas. I mean, obviously sometimes you write something like this is actually rubbish, I'm throwing this away. But try not to nip ideas in the bud that maybe yeah. in the previous band like so I've got this song that I want to write that's a, a soundtrack, uh, a kind of a theme tune to an imaginary cop show. Like, and how will we play that live? Like, oh yeah, you're right. So scrap that. We don't need, we don't do that. Whereas these days it'd be like, great, well, I have to play it live. <laughs> I can create it and I can stick it on an EP. Yeah, and although although sometimes it's amazing what will actually translate to live, and and true. how uh, how much of a revelation that is. It, it's like I was here. I'll. I'll show you. It's it was actually great. I was at a Christmas party. Let's see if we can put it up. Fab. I recognize. Um, and it was it was a Pink Floyd cover band, and they played uh, "Wish You Were Here" and "Dark Side of the Moon" in their entireties as two sets. And the band was fabulous. Like they were really good. Like they were a lot of them were studio musicians, so they they knew how to play, and you know they'd obviously practiced it and whatever. But it was a revelation to hear those records live, uh, because Pink Floyd were actually a pretty funky band. Yeah, <laughs> you know they they were. You don't really get it from the records because they 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 you know they obviously the, there was so much detail on the production and on you yeah, know, yeah. but. They rocked. They they rocked out. You know what I mean? They were they were a fun live band. People were dancing. Oh, um, I don't, which, I don't which, know. My which, dad saw them, I think, around the time of Wish You Were Here and said it was probably the most boring concert he ever saw because he said he could have just it was so perfect. Yeah. He could have just put the record on. And he was yeah. he was a huge is a huge Floyd fan, but said it was phenomenally disappointing because he I think he'd rather have seen the Who live. I think ultimately, no. that that's where you know he, he might have loved Floyd more, but he didn't want that. Yeah, no. I, it, listen, in that period, I think seeing the Who live would have been the better. They were great live, man. I I I, I stumbled across some uh, some of the. They were in a, a studio at one point. It was around uh, Who's Next. And they they did a whole bunch of recordings. It was I think it was for a TV show or, or something like that. And so they're playing. You know, they'd set up in in some big sound stage uh, with their full gear uh, and did a live show. And man, oh man, what a band! That's like like just that's... absolutely. It was it's the ones where you know, and they were doing it was basically all of the bigger stuff of the later period, and and just the sound was. I think that's the Lighthouse project, right? That was that the one. Where... Uh, no, no, no. I think this was afterwards. Uh, I think this was like this would have been around 74, 75. Okay. It was after Lighthouse. Uh, but it was it was just because Lighthouse became who's next, didn't it? Yes. So... Yeah, I think I think so, but I I don't think this was I think this was something to promote it. It was like it, because these are days pre pre sort of videos, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it was, it was when they, you know, it was at the period when the Rolling Stones were doing those show, you know, the show. That there's actually footage from that, which is crazy too, where they 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 made the mistake of inviting the Who, <laughs> Rock and Roll Circus. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, exactly. And the and Who, the who did like the best band. <laughs> By far, no, but they were just that performance. It was holy camoli. It's like that's when you realize why people were so crazy about Keith Moon. Yeah. Like he was such a good drummer. Oh my God. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. You know, Hal Blaine territory for me. You know what I mean? Just so hooky. There's so many other songs like that. The, the hooks are built around his around the drums, yeah. and the drum fills and the breaks and just the great band. I always yeah. love that later in, you know, bands you know about and you're aware of and you've heard them in, in the part, you know what I mean? But you never really got into and then you get into them later and you realize just how good they were or why they were so, you know what I mean? Yeah, why they were when so I was popular. When I was younger, The Who were a huge, huge yeah. influence on me. Um, and actually, similarly, I think as I've got older, I don't tend to listen to them that much these days but I 
think Townsend's approach to the guitar, and some of it is born of necessity, right? Because, you know, he quite rightly looks at himself and goes, well, I'm not Jeff Beck or Jimi Hendrix. Yep. So I have to find a different way of using this instrument. But in many ways, for me at least, his way of approaching a guitar and then moving into stuff like synths on Who's Next is is a more modern it, it allows him to have a, a longer, in a sense, influence than someone who I think Jeff Beck is an incredible guitarist. But he's a, he's a guitarist that guitarists love. Yeah. He's not someone who necessarily, unless you are absolutely besotted with electric guitars, you don't necessarily need to go and listen to a lot of Jeff Beck stuff. He was never Outside a good writer. He was never a good writer. No, no. I think, that, I think that, was, that was part of the reason, <laughs> you know. Now, listen, it's the same thing with Richie Blackmore. You know, another of the, 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 the pantheon of that period, right? It's like I was watching this this video. It was a the, the biography film of the deep of Deep Purple, <laughs> you know, which is <laughs> there's a there's a band that didn't make it to eight years, right? <laughs> well, they barely ever made it to two years of the same life. Well, yeah, well, well, no, but the but the first iteration, I think they were together for three of the the, the really good one, the one that did uh, Motorhead, which is for me that's a great record. You know, that that's a truly. It's the one with space. Well, that's the record. second iteration, right? Because they'd already done like Hush. Yes, no, they they, 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 they did Hush, and, and then they, they kicked the they kicked the the vocal and, and, and the bass player because I guess yeah. the bassist they'd come in together. Yeah, and they always uh, replaced. And Rich, and Ricky Blackmore was a psychopath. It sounds yeah. like like the whole band, but anyway, they, they and and they got the new singer. They got Ian Gillen, yeah. and then the bassist. What what what's his name? It was in and out of the band. What I can see his face. I yeah, yeah. You know, he wears that funny hat all the time now. Yeah, glad. Anyway, but but also a great player. And then that that was sort of the classic lineup after Hush and after the. Uh, I think they. I think they actually they started for that Philharmonic project. Yeah. Which would have been and the then, second record, and then they had you know Purple and whatever and in rock that, that that exactly and that stretch of three or four really good albums before they broke up. Uh, but but yeah, that was just it was it was interesting to. We're, go, we're going back to thirteen-year-old me territory with Deep Purple. Well, they, they were you know they were one of those sem seminal bands, right? In their great period, they, they, I don't think they were as good as Black Sabbath, quite honestly, yeah. because Black Sabbath were just the first two or three albums. Were Sabbath, I, I think the thing is Sabbath, I still listen to. So yeah, a... well, I mean, you know, I I Iomi was was possibly well, he's definitely the greatest riff guitarist of all time uh, and no one who come close to the, the the guy from acdc maybe you know they've never been that have never done it for me i don't know why yeah um but sabbath yeah i i love and but for me in terms of guitar heroes it was hendrix page and pete green okay the, those three always um, <clears throat> and pete, pete green I think especially there's just there's something in the tone. It's yeah. Just, it, going back to the point of like guitars and tone, there's something about Pete Green's guitar tone that was just beautiful. Um, and and I think I think in all cases they they have a unique sound. And yeah. I think that's what really attracts me to to almost any instrument. Mm -hmm. Any instrumentalist, actually, regardless of whether in a band or not, is the. I might not always love it, but is the definitely themselves in what they do? You know, I, I mentioned McGeek earlier, and he's probably my favourite guitarist from the the post punk period. But again, it's it's such a you such an easily definable sound. You know, yeah. it's, it's his fingers behind that fretboard regardless of what instrument he's playing it's so clearly him and i, I think that's something that i'm really really drawn to and same thing with kind of the, the 90s guitarist that I, I loved growing up as well is that, it's that you know who it is there, there's something about the way they tear a chord to get out of the guitar or the way they slide up to something that makes them themselves and, and iomi has that in space i mean obviously partly 
by <laughs> misadventure and losing losing the ends of his fingers but also i think just through the way he phrases things his phrasing yeah. is is unique it doesn't sound like anyone else yeah um, no, it's totally, totally, YouTube. and so hooky, hooky, hooky. Yeah. The number of hit, like the of songs that will stand the test of time, yeah. that are just all based on his guitar. You know, I mean, they were they were a great band. The other, you know, the the other guy, they they formed one of those crucial trios, mm. just in the same way that the Who did, you know, or Led Zeppelin for that matter, because they're all power trios basically, yeah, yeah. singers, right? Um, you know, uh, but and and each of those you could not imagine them without all three members, yeah, yeah, because all three members are what make the you know make it. But and those are three great guitarists too, right? <laughs> you know, when you think about it, yeah. But you know? but they're also yeah three great bass players and three great great drummers as well. Yeah, you know, it's that it's that yeah. totality coming together to create well, exactly throw jimmy page and uh and 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 joe walsh in and you've got the you know what i mean you've got pretty well all the great 60s bands are a great majority of them right yeah yeah because the james gang were great too again they're one of those bands that i've not properly yeah. invested yeah, that's uh there's a reason why they the eagles uh, got him as their guitarist he had a, he had a, quite a career before then, <laughs> but shortened and but you know what I mean, yeah. an American and obviously they they were you know I think prejudiced against a little bit during that time period. It was all the great guitarists were all British, right? Yeah, I think there was oh, a little bit of of that going on. Seen as well. that seen that way. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I don't I think it came out of the blues tradition as much. It was more of right. a, um, a soul, like garage band soul fusion. So that, I mean, yeah, you know. I mean, that, also that's probably a massive, yeah, a massive issue, right? Because no one is seen outside of that sphere anyway. I mean, you know, as much as people like Jimi Hendrix might have, and I think probably George Harrison and, and Keith Richards might have loved someone like Steve Cropper. No one else was really talking about him by like 1968. Yeah, you know, it was it was very much either someone like Buddy Guy or you know going right back to someone like Muddy Waters who was being seen or you know if you're if you're Pete Green or at least Fleetwood Mac sort of Elmore James being referenced. You're not referencing any genre that isn't coming out of a blues, whether electric or acoustic. If yeah. you're talking guitar players, and yeah, you're right. I mean that's. And that's also a departure from where any of those guys started because for so many of them, they started with rock and roll and, and kind of rockabilly being beautiful. Yeah. Being being where they're actually <laughs> they're they're interested in. Yeah. I I find I find as I get older I'm far less interested in like guitar players that play lots of notes and far more interested in guitarists that create sounds and soundscapes with the guitars and i find that a much more exciting way to approach guitar and i think some of that is still even 20 years later still a reaction to sit, sitting in a room with 16 and it won't shock you to know that at the guitar institute everyone was male mm. um and 16 kind of guys who just spent their entire life wanting to be eddie van halen or steve Vai. it was like yeah this is great. How and you want to be a musician? Yeah, there's already a position filled for Steve Vai. He's kind of got that covered. Like, what what are you going to do, Steve Vai Mark Two? Exactly. That's going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you know. For, for me, that was a big, an essential eye opener. I learned so much, but I think the most valuable thing I learned was what I didn't want to do. Yep. And what I didn't want to sound like, and who I didn't really didn't want to be um and it because the choosers were brilliant i learned you know things like playing in time and and listening to the basses um and every week we used to have live performance which was the bit that i was actually quite good yeah. at um, yeah. and you'd cycle between four different guitar parts some of which because it was a live band and you know there were guitarists keyboardists bassists and drummers and vocalists at the school um, some of you would be 
like trying to imitate horns on a guitar or trying to imitate a part that we didn't have but playing guitar and, and you cycle through the four different guitar parts that everyone was supposed to have learned and i found that stuff far more useful than you know let's say lesson today at nine o'clock is rock two it was like yeah no i'm gonna get more out of this by playing with other people rather than sitting in a room with 16 other guys with unplugged guitars running scales no no de definitely definitely so i've got two last questions for you before i let yep. you go uh, the first one is, what would you say uh, was the album that most influenced you? Oh, my God. Um, obviously, if you ask me in an hour's time, it will probably be a different answer. Fair, fair answer. Um, I can maybe say the album that I think influences what I do now musically yep. most and I think possibly possibly Second Hand Daylight by Magazine, their second album um, and more in terms of the tone than the mm -hmm. actual songwriting but there's a there's a sort of damp, slightly sick ill sort of feeling to that album it's it's not very cheery. It's it's quite wintry, mm. and I think I think that probably is one of if I if I look back at everything I've ever written. Yeah. So only really the the kind of the main band because I don't include what I wrote when I was sixteen because it was just pretty much obviously a rip off of lots of other bands. But um, I think that probably would always have been there as an influence. So for the whole time I've been writing. It's always been there, and different bits of it will have been the bits I've lent on, yeah, um, and and gone for. So maybe secondhand daylight, um, yeah, because yeah, I, I still listen to it regularly, and it still it still has the power to shock, and still has the power to like for me to listen and go, oh, I've never heard that bit before. It 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 surprises me how little known they are. Uh, yeah, they, because they were definitely one of the best bands of that whole period. Uh, but you know, it's, it's I think strange. They, they're, they're di they're so, they were sort of difficult at the time, right? Because they didn't yeah. follow. I think someone said, you know, the holy rules of punk were that will not be pretentious. Well, they frequently yeah. reference kind of stuff like Dostoevsky, so that's kind of pretentious. You shouldn't have keyboards if you're a punk band. Well, they've got keyboards and they've got synths, so there's yeah. that as well. And, and you probably be shouldn't be doing covers of Sly and the Family Stones. No, right? and and you know, and beef <laughs> And then having um, the audacity to have them become hits. Yeah, well, even worse. And and I mean, I think a lot of people think it's downhill from Shot, which is their first single. But yeah, to me, they're the first three albums are just equally brilliant. But Secondhand Daylight has just a cohesion of sonic possibilities that i i yeah. really love and and it has this yeah this gloomy heavy i think it is a british gothic to it because mm. it's not overblown in the same way as like sabbathar but there is that understated melancholy and horror running the whole way through it and and i think there are elements of that in what i do so yeah let, let's go for that and you know it's yeah. got so many of my favorite musicians in it so good choice so, so that's a good call question number two yeah what was the first record you bought record tape cd of course right. depending. so with your first, own money not not the the, the, right. the the gift from your mother the first one that you actually bought on your right. own spending your hard-earned cash that week's allowance you know you're gonna have to so, listen to it at least 40 times until you can buy something new so the first album I requested, but this was bought by my parents, was the first Communards album in about 85, 86. Right. But the first album I think I handed over money for um, was probably... So the first cassette was definitely mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, Bad, which is okay. a, a, exactly a product of its time. Yep. The first CD was Jimi Hendrix. 
a weird compilation called The Gold Collection. And the first second-hand vinyl was um, Strangler's Oral Sculpture. And that mm, was 50 pence from a car boot sale when I was 13. Uh, not the best Strangler's album, but yeah, I knew the name. One. No, it wasn't as good. Feline was the best, I think. Yeah. At least the one I, I, I like. I quite like, um, what's the, the one with Aratus Norvigicus as well? Uh, that I was like the that. first one, wasn't it? Yeah. Because just it was just called the Stranglers, wasn't it? The one, the one with the sort of very, uh, with the photo where they were trying to pretend they were the Cramps. Mm, so the, the one I'm talking about has, has got um, get a grip on yourself on. Yeah, with, I think that was yeah. the and Peaches. I think was on it too. It was the yeah. first record. Yeah, I, I saw them live. They were uh, a difficult band. Yeah, these yeah. days I'm more of a Damned fan, but um, but. I was 13, it was a car boot sale, it was there, so it got it came home. But yeah, I suppose technically the first album would be would be bad, which yeah. um it yeah, wasn't I, would, I have to say I don't listen to it now. <laughs> but no, uh, but I, th I think listen, I think it was uh it was worth it was oh, a very influential record. Yeah, absolutely. Although yeah. I, I'd much prefer off the wall as an adult. Yes, no, off the wall is is off the wall's good. Yeah, but I mean bad had all the hits though. It's not surprising and better production. Well, they were both pretty well produced. Yeah, it was more of a pop album. Off the Wall yeah, was, absolutely. More of a, was more absolutely. of a soul dance disco album almost. You know? Um, but but yeah, I, I think. And the first new vinyl I ever bought when I was mm -hmm. 14 was, or 15 was Bjork Post. So. Yeah, it was pretty um, good. Good yeah. selection. Yeah, eclectic. Mm -hmm. and, and I think. If, if anyone kind of enjoys my music, I think one of the reasons that hopefully it's interesting is at least I listen to a wide variety of different music. And I, I still really, really cling to this idea that the more input you have, the more exciting the output has to be. Because yeah. if all you ever listen to is one genre or you know one artist, it's going to be really difficult for you to synthesize something interesting out of that. Yeah. I mean, the problem with me is I don't listen to anything anymore. Really? <laughs> I just listen to my own stuff. Well, I don't. I don't. Be... I find I don't really have the time or the energy. And I, I, I stopped for many years. I, I, I became very uh, disillusioned with the music industry. Yeah, yeah and I, I get that. I think I'm because effectively this is. I'm under no illusions that I'm going to, you know, make my fortune out of music. On the one hand, I have my absolute passion for going and finding new bands from particularly the kind of the periods of the late 60s and that 78 yeah. to, let's say, 83 period, because there's always stuff that I don't know. You know mm, totally. I recently got an album of uh, Swiss new wave music from like 79 to 83. And there were loads of really good bands on, on there um, that I would never have heard of. Well, actually, just before I go, I, I did... The best purchase of that, I bought an Italian New Wave album. It was just a compilation. I bought it because it had a great front cover. Uh, <laughs> just a front cover of a, a kind of a black synth on a yellow background. It looked great. It stood mm -hmm. out in the shop, so I bought it. And I took it home and I listened to it. And I was like, this is, this is really, really weird. I mean, the vocals are all mental. But okay, cool. Maybe that's what they were into. I was like, I don't really see how we get from, from this to Italo Disco. Because it's slowed down and that doesn't make much sense, but never mind. So I took the record off. I, you can probably guess where we're going with this. Put the next record on that I bought and was like, oh, that's too fast. <laughs> took it off, put the Italo, the Italo sort of electronic album back on. It's like, oh no, they just sounded like Joy Division and Human League, <laughs> but it was just sped up and it made them sound really, you know, if you imagine like any Ian Curtis style, or oh, do, do, do. It kind of still works. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave yeah. you with the last story, and this is quite funny. And also on that subject, now, if you go back and you're old enough, you'll remember record players not only had 33 and 45, there was also a 16. Oh, yes, there was a very, very slow format, right? As well. So what was that for? For like something well, really? It, oh, it's the format wars, right? Just as you had right. seventy-eight. I mean, it was to get more on a record. It's right. probably more for classical music and stuff like that. But it was still around in the early, you know, the sixties, early seventies. 
And of course, you know, you get the hand-me-down equipment and it ends up in the rec room with the kids, right? And uh, a couple, a friend of mine, his, he had two older siblings, and this is back in the 70s. Um, the older sibling played a trick on the sister. And what he did is he got her stoned for the first time and then put on a record and put it down to 16. And the record started playing. And of course, she, you know, the first time she'd, she'd got stoned and the music was really slow. And then the bastard <laughs> turned around and said, are you all? And the poor girl, I don't think she ever tried it again in her life. <laughs> That was was very, very bad. So any anyone listening, don't do that. Not not that you you'd have a trouble, I think, finding a record player. Well, finding records of a record player to do it these days, but you know, don't don't do it. You can do it on a tape machine, though. Yes, tape machine would work work well. But anyway, (laughs) it's it's just so the type of thing people did, right? Back back then in the day before uh before the enlightenment came. Anyway, Mark, thank you so much. It was a You're pleasure. You're very welcome. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, no, it was a real uh, pleasure. Great chat. And uh, good luck with the release in March. And Thanks I'll very much. have you on uh, again at some point, And we'll, maybe we'll find some subject uh, to talk about something obscure uh, Always and good interesting. For obscure. What's that? Always good for obscure. Exactly. I figured you might be. <laughs> anyway, take care and you just too. stay online and we'll we'll say our, our goodbyes after right. we end. So anyway, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, Merry, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, I will uh, see you all in the new year. This is actually, we're going to put this out on the, let me think, the 24th. When, when is Saturday? Yeah, it's the 24th. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We, we will put this out on the 24th. So happy, happy Christmas. Enjoy and spend some time with your families and please eat too much. Definitely. It's what it's what the time of year is for, right? The season demands it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Take care.